Everyone, thank you for coming out today. My name is Catherine Foreman Gray, and I'm a History and Preservation Officer with Cherokee Nation. And today we've got David Fowler, who is a Site Superintendent of the Merle Home, Fort Gibson Historic Site, and also Cabin Creek Battlefield. And he's going to be talking about Cherokee Nation and the Civil War. This is the last, excuse me, I'm a little under the weather, but um, in case you can't understand me. Uh, this is going to be the last uh, presentation of four this month that was in celebration of Native American Heritage Month. Um, we also do plan on having more of these, um, probably starting in January. We'll be uh, starting the monthly history presentations again. So if you guys have any ideas or um, recommendations on people, please feel free to, to contact me. With that, I'm going to go ahead and let David take over. All right, thank you. Is this working? Can you guys hear me? Um, I like to walk around when I do these. I'm kind of an informal person, so anytime that you have any questions, any, if, I, if I don't cover something, um, we're actually going to go over a little bit more of, of some places that you can go and see, um, learn, experience a little bit of, of, um, of, the, uh, of the Civil War that, that happened in Indian Territory and the Cherokee Nation. Um, I uh, serve on the, uh, on the uh, the CW150 um, commission, it, it actually as, a, as an advisor to that commission with the Historical Society. And um, at the beginning, as the, the 150th anniversary of the Civil War rolled around, um, everybody, there was a, a lot of, of talk about how we were going to do this, what, you know, what was going to, what was going to happen, how were the events going to unfold. Um, of course, Everybody had great ideas, and a thousand letters went out to uh, uh, to every tribe that was involved in the war, um, to other state entities that um, that their soldiers fought in Indian Territory during the war. And I think we got about two responses back from the whole thing. So we uh, had to kind of start from from ground zero and make sure that that as we started um, talking about. Um, you know, commemorating you know the war. What you know? What would we? What would we talk about? What would be focused on? Um, and uh, so it was became aware to a lot of us that were involved in this that um, that that the one thing that most people always said is that I really didn't realize that there was a war. You know, the Civil War was in Indian Territory, and uh, of course, for most of us who you know are from here. Um, they have dealt with the history. We all know it. Um, everybody always says every day that, well, this is a really good kept secret, you know, the, you know, the, the history of the, of the war in Indian Territory. And it's really not. It's probably, um, it, it's probably one of the most uh, um, written about, talked about uh, um, aspects of the American Civil War. And, um, and although that the... Uh, um, India territory was not a part of the United States. Um, the tribes that, that were that resided within Indian territory were independent nations, and that the United States and the Confederacy um, both signed um, treaties with um, with the tribes within Indian territory. Uh, it still had a, a, a profound effect on this area. Um, Dr. Corbett, who from Northeastern State University, uh, refers to this as many times as the watershed moment in history, which is uh, very much true because at that point, nothing will ever return to the way it was before this point in history. So of, of a lot of the things that have, that have occurred in our, in, in our history of the Cherokee Nation, this is probably uh, one of the most profound moments um, once, you know, our ancestors got to Indian Territory. So from this point forward in history, nothing that, um, that, that as it was before the war really recovers from it. So like the United States, um, this is probably the one defining moment, good or bad, that affects our history as much as anything. So it is very important that, you know, that we made sure that in this in this, you know, commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War that, you know, that our story was told. And uh, so that was kind of, kind of my involvement, making sure that, that um, at least the Cherokee voice was, was heard as we started into the, uh, into the, the 150th of the anniversary of the Civil War. So um, 
at the start of the war, just to kind of give a little bit of background here. Um, oop, wrong way. Forgive me if I get a little messed up on this computer. I'm kind of technologically challenged. And um, you can, uh, there's a, these are a few of the places where a few skirmishes, there were about 125 pitch battles and skirmishes that happened throughout Indian Territory um, from, from 1861 to the close of the war in 1865. Um, most of the fighting occurs in the Cherokee Nation. So as the struggle for uh, Indian, you know, Indian Territory was kind of the, the middle road between, you know, the, the states in, the, in the Kansas in the north and then, of course, being bordered by Missouri, Arkansas, you know, close to Louisiana, uh, Texas right there. Um, it, it was a, kind of a central fly zone for those armies to try to, to move around. It was also seen as a, by both sides, as a very good... Uh, Opportunity for a source of, of manpower that um, there were, you know, young men here that could be recruited into the military. Uh, plus, it was uh, also very prosperous, you know, as a, as a place to be able to obtain uh, materials to wage war with. So, uh, food, anything of that nature that could be used to, to, to feed and move armies. Um, there was one uh, a fairly large battle that happened. Um, down at, at Middle Boggy, so that's the one that you see at the very bottom of the screen. The largest uh, battle that, that occurs in Indian territories in Honey Springs, which is actually in the Creek Nation, but uh, on both sides of that conflict, there were, uh, uh, there were, there were Cherokee troops. So this kind of gives you a little bit of, a, of an idea of, uh, of where a lot of the fighting's going on in some of the larger battles that happen in Indian territory. Um, one of the things that, that I'm really going to kind of kind of talk to you all about are places where you can like physically go and see the, you know, a, a piece of history where you can go to learn about it. Historic sites that are, that are, are open today of places where you can go and, and, and this can all be, you know, is, is interpreted and, and you'll be able to, uh, to see that because we have a, a, a lot of, um, I mean, many times I, I get people that walk into, you know, the Merle home to Fort Gibson and say, wow, I didn't even know all this was here, you know, in, whenever, you know, it's been there since 1824 and 1845, you know, but uh, um, so I, you know, I want to kind of bring that, you know, forward to where, you know, if you're interested in, uh, in, in learning and in being able to, you know, to, to walk a battlefield, to be in these places, um, they, they are very, you know, very well alive and they're able for, you know, for us to, uh, to experience them, so... <laughs> Yeah. Oop, wrong way again. All right, these are a, are a few of the historic sites that that um, that are, are relative to it. I know we don't have them tagged up there. In the uh, in the far uh, left hand corner is a Fort Gibson historic site. Um, Fort Gibson was uh, established in 1824. It uh, it was closed in in uh, um, in 1857. And uh, at the time that the war broke out, it, it was uh, um, the, the military post had been turned over to the, uh, uh, to the, the government of the Cherokee Nation. And uh, there were, you know, there were, of course, people that had, had moved into the log structures that were down there. They were living in them, using them as homes, barns, houses, things of that nature. So there wasn't a military presence there, uh, which was one of the, one of the problems that... Um, that uh, uh, Chief Ross uh, came across at the time that the war broke out was that um, he wanted to remain neutral. He necessarily didn't care to get involved in this fight, um, but uh, without the presence of federal soldiers um, in Indian Territory, which was part of the United States agreement, that uh, they would provide military protection um, for the tribes in Indian Territory, um, that uh, Fort Gibson, um, the other little shed there with a the cannon underneath of it is what's left of Fort Towson. Um, it had been closed uh, earlier in 1851. And then, of course, at the bottom, which was Fort Washita, which was garrisoned in 1860, um, in 61, but the federal soldiers were also pulled out of there. And, uh, and two other forts, Fort Cobb and... Um, uh, Fort Arbuckle, which were in the far western edge of uh, of the uh, 
of the Chickasaw Nation. Those soldiers were pulled out and taken to Kansas, and later on they made their journey all the way back to, uh, to Washington City to be a part of the Army of the Potomac. But, um, but the, the, the void of those soldiers opened up the door for the Confederacy to come into Indian Territory and, uh, and, and do heavy campaigning for the tribes to uh, sign agreements with them. And so all of, the, all of the five nations that were within the Indian Territory at the time signed, uh, um, signed treaties with the Confederacy, um, though, though three of those five were very reluctant to do so. Um, but... Uh, Fort, uh, Fort Towson, which is on the on the uh, the, the top right hand side of that of that picture, there is an archaeological site today. Um, it was very important in in our history, is that that was the the, the site um, of of where um, Stan Wadey surrendered, who was the uh, the last uh, uh, Confederate general to surrender during the war. Um, he, he did so at Fort Towson and uh, in a little place called Dokesville, which is a small community that was connected to uh, um, connected to uh, Fort Towson. So it was kind of a of a small community that served uh, served the fort there. So you can uh, you can go there today and and uh, and venture into uh, um, in, into Dokesville to the remains of what it is. It's also an archaeological site. Uh, these are located in the far southeastern corner of the state down towards, uh, towards the, uh, the town of Hugo. Um, of course, in the center there, as many of you are from Tahlequah, recognize that as, a, as being an icon of Tahlequah, of uh, Park Hill. Uh, that is the Merle home. It was the, the home of George Merle and his wife. Uh, at the time, Amanda, he had first been married to Minerva Ross, and uh, when she passed away, he married her sister, and so we had uh, two Mrs. Rosses from the same from the same Merle family. But this house is located just down the road from where y'all are working, um, from Rose Cottage, which was a uh, an area that um, that where most of the uh, uh, of the the Ross family lived, um, conducted business. They had a series of uh, of uh, plantation mansions that that were. You know, strung out through the uh, through the valley down there. Um, this is a is a very good place to go to learn about life before the war, life during the war. Um, Shirley Pettengill here, who's sitting with us, had spent a lot of time researching, uh, particularly during the war. You know what the uh, what the Ross ladies had had uh, had endured um, during this time. So it's a. Um, um, you know, it's it's a very good place to go and get a good glimpse of of what civilian life was like before the war started out, but also what life was like uh, for those uh, for those citizens who got caught in the middle of this and could not get out of the way. So, the, you know, many of the of the uh, of the Ross family members were able to flee into Kansas and to and to remove themselves from um, from Indian Territory. You know, from from this area. And uh, some, although had to flee down um, towards the towards the south, but these um, um, the few that stayed behind um, had probably one of the hardest times because of of uh, of not being able to to obtain food. A lot of times, when they would, the armies would come by and take it from them. Um, they were basically defenseless women who were, um, you know, trying to ride out this uh, this horrible pe period in history. So. So it's a very good place to uh, um, to, uh, to to go to get that that experience. On the very bottom is uh, Fort Washita. Unfortunately, it doesn't look that way. Vandals broke in and burnt the uh, the, the large structure down a couple of years ago, but uh, but it is still there and open for business. Uh, this was uh, where most of the uh, of the Confederates garrisoned out of. So any troops that were that were um, that were with um, the Confederacy would uh, would periodically operate out of Fort Washita. This is in the uh, Chickasaw Nation um, that uh, Wadey and his men uh, would often um, ride down that far to try to regain supplies and to uh, um, and to uh, uh, reprovision it. Um, so it's kind of a kind of very representative of when you go there today. It tells the story of the of the Confederacy during this time. <clears throat> Some of the battlefields that that you can visit um, 
The, uh, the one on the top is uh, Cabin Creek Battlefield. It's located near Pensacola, Oklahoma today. It is, um, uh, we're in the process of, it has a 10 acres that, that is, is owned outright by the state. There's another 250 acres that, that we're currently working on acquiring. Um, this is uh, um, basically what, they, what the, uh, the Federal Army does is that once Arkansas is cut off, the supply routes that were coming uh, to the forts from Arkansas, which, you know, via the Arkansas River, um, you know, that supply route is no longer accessible for federal troops. So they have to supply um, coming out of Fort Scott, Kansas. So about a day's ride from, from Fort Scott all the way to Fort Gibson, they will establish uh, way stations so that they can, so as they're bringing supplies down, they, uh, they, can, they can, in a day's travel, reach one of these fortified way stations. And uh, the first one that they would encounter coming out of Fort Scott was on the border at Baxter Springs, Kansas. From Baxter Springs, Kansas, they had to push hard enough that they would make them, so they, they could make it all the way to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, the, cab to, to the Cabin Creek crossing, um, which is where Greenbrier Joe Martin um, had had his uh, uh, ranching operation there before the war, so they used uh, as the Federal Army came in, and of course uh, Joe Martin was uh, was a captain in Wadey's regiment. Um, he vacated the the the, uh, the area, and the Federals fortified his home and held that crossing there. So it became sort of a of a, of a small fortification. Um, the, uh, it, it also became, as the Federals, you know, would sometimes leave that area, the, the Confederate troops would move in and, uh, and try to harass the, the wagon trains that were being brought down from, from Kansas to, to resupply uh, Fort Gibson. Uh, there, were two, there were two major battles at, at Cabin Creek, one in, 60, one in 62 and another one in 1864. The, I'm sorry, one in 1863 and one in 1864. The, uh, the battle in, in 1863 was kind of a prelude to, uh, to the battle at Honey Springs, which was the largest battle in Indian Territory. Um, at, uh, at the Cabin Creek Crossing, by the time that, that the federal reinforcements that were headed to Fort Gibson so that they could, they could go and attack the Confederates at, at Honey Springs, um, was led by a gentleman um, named uh, 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 Phillips, Colonel Phillips, who, um, who was in command of the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, which is the first black regiment formed and in, in, into combat in the Civil War, regardless as to what they say about the 54th, okay, is that, um, that these, uh, um, and, and he was in command of the regiment. In support of that regiment, were, uh, were four companies of the 3rd Indian Home Guard, which were made up mostly of, of Park Hill men, men from around Tahlequah, and, uh, and, and the 6th Kansas Cavalry, and uh, in a detachment of, of, of Hopkins Artillery, all from Kansas. And, um, and so they, they ran into um, to a, a detachment of Stan Wadey's troops that were at that crossing to try to stop them from being able to reinforce Fort Gibson. All right, so little and next to nothing, everybody kind of blows this little, this little fight off. They start late in the afternoon on the, on the, the, on the 1st of July, and, um, and by dark, nothing's really decided. It had rained very hard, the creek was up really high, and um, so, so the, they, they kind of just stood off both sides. The next morning, they resumed the fight as the creek had dropped back down. And, um, and uh, Colonel, I'm sorry, did I, if, if, I, if I called the gentleman Phillips, did I? It's Williams, actually. Colonel Williams decides that, um, that he's had about enough of this, so he launches everybody across the creek to take, uh, to take the positions where Wadey's men were on the ridge um, above them. And uh, he does something that's a little different in, in Civil War tactics, which is he, he does a combined assault instead of, uh, instead of you know, piecemealing his, his troops into it. 
So he has the, the first Kansas colored and the third Indian home guard attack the center of the line. He sends the cavalry around the sides, and at the same time, he cuts loose with every artillery piece he has along the creek. And in about 20 minutes, he drives Wadey's men off. Um, they, they fall back uh, past Fort Gibson. So this column is allowed to, to make its way um, on in to resupply and reinforce Fort Gibson. Well, 17 days later, this column... Okay, it gives the strength enough to the Federal Army that they're able to leave Fort Gibson, travel to Honey Springs, and attack the Confederates before, their, before two large armies can mass up together. And so, so a, a tiny little battle at a place on a creek where nobody really cared a whole lot about becomes the turning point and by which that the Federal Army takes control of, uh, uh, of the, uh, of, uh, basically of the, of the northern half of Indian Territory. Okay, so it's, uh, um, it becomes a significant little fight. Um, later on, at the end of the war in 1864, as, as Wadey's men are about to, to starve to death and all of the refugees associated with them that are in the Choctaw, in, in the Choctaw Nation and in northern Texas, um, they decide that they need to, uh, they, they desperately need to take a, a wagon train that is headed from Fort Scott, Kansas again to supply um, the, uh, the federal refugees and the federal army at Fort Gibson. It's a very large wagon train, over a million and a half dollars in 1864 money. And, um, and uh, um, Colonel Wadey, and, or actually General at the time, and, uh, and General Gannot from Texas, um, are successful in taking this wagon train um, to little consequences to the whole entire of the war, but it made a big difference to those refugees that were that were starving to death down in, in the Choctaw Nation. Um, the, uh, the, by this time, the federal you know the federal army was able to just keep, you know through attrition to be able to recoup from the losses of of, of what they had you know had lost at, at Cabin Creek. But, uh, but it meant survival to, uh, um, to many of the, of the refugees who were um, are about to succumb to, to hunger in the, it, down in the, in the Choctaw Nation. So, so we have two very significant happenings at, um, at, uh, at, at the Cabin Creek battlefield. And, um, and, to this, and, and to this day, that was the, the, the loss of the wagon train at, uh, at Cabin Creek was the... Uh, was the largest um, uh, loss of federal supplies during the war. Okay, so it was it was a, a pretty large and pretty significant. Now the uh, the other place that you can travel to is uh, is is the Honey Springs battlefield at Shakota. Um, it's uh, it's actually in Rennigsville, not uh, not in Shakota, but we always associate it with Shakota because if you can make your way to there, you can find the signs. No one knows where Rennigsville's at, so it. Uh, but uh, this is the largest battle uh, in Indian Territory. About about four thousand troops involved here. <clears throat> there were uh, there were Cherokee regiments on both sides in this fight. Um, that uh, uh, there were elements of of Wadey's regiment that were fighting. Uh, with the Confederacy. Um, essentially what we have is we have a very large contingent under uh, Douglas Cooper who is at, uh, encamped at, uh, at, a, at this place, Honey Springs. There's not actually one spring as we think of it. There are a whole series of springs and if you ever get on a tractor and drive through the area, you'll find every one of them. And, um, but, um, but they were encamped in this area waiting for a, a large army under General Cabell coming out of Arkansas to, uh, uh, to link up together. And, their, and their, their purpose was they were going to attack Fort Gibson and drive the Federal Army uh, back, into, uh, uh, back into Kansas or destroy it, but to, uh, to try to, to break the Federal hold um, on Fort Gibson. So this... Uh, um, the uh, the Federals, however, saw the the need to take the fight to uh, um, to the to the Confederates before they knew that they were outnumbered. If they stayed uh, behind the uh, the earth fort that they had dug around um, the uh, some of the, the leftover buildings at Fort Gibson, that they would be destroyed. So um, they 
basically had uh, the, the saving grace of the whole battle for the Federals were that, um, that they had better equipment, they were better trained, and they had more artillery. Um, the Confederates outnumbered them about three to one, um, but, um, but the, the Federal Army was still able to, uh, to, to pull off that fight. So we have, we have two very significant battlefields in that, you know, that, are, that lie very close to us that, that have a lot to do with, um, with, uh, you know, with, with our history and our involvement in Indian Territory during this war that, um, that we're, are within basically you know, a 30-minute drive of where we're at right here. 45, we'll say. It depends on how fast you want to drive it out. But, um, so, all right. And then, of course, we have a, we have a plethora of events. We, we always have tons of, of, uh, of different events and different things that you can, that you can go to and see. Uh, for those of you who like to, uh, um, to uh, witness this type of thing, um, of course, the Lawn Social, uh, every year we have, uh, we have something at the Merle Home. Every summer we have a Teacher's Institute that if you know anybody who, who teaches within your community that would like to, uh, would like to, uh, to attend that, they can most definitely call, call the Merle Home. And then, of course, Education Day at the Ca Cabin Creek Battlefield and a call to arms. Um, there are some websites that you can visit. Um, that, uh, that, 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 you know, to be able to obtain a lot of information off of these. Um, the uh, OKCivilWar.org has, a, has a, a ton of different links and, and places that you can go to. People, you can see all of the treaties that were, uh, that were signed between, uh, between the five tribes and, and the Confederacy are on there. Um, there are also personal letters that um, that were written by um, by a, a lot of the people that were that were involved in the war here. Um, that uh, so there's there's a lot of a lot of information on on both of those sites the the uh, the OKCivilWar.org and the OKHistory.org is our is our main web page. Um, they do have a, an archives in, in Oklahoma City. It's, it's huge. It's a very large library. You can walk inside, tell them what you're looking for. The people in there are very nice. They will help you in, uh, in any of your research projects. Um, the, uh, it, it's, that is probably a, a, a well-kept secret. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, that the state of Oklahoma does have uh, you know, an archives base where you can go physically walk into this room and these people will help you with, you know, with your research projects that, that you're doing. Um, and, there is a, and there is a lot of information in this place. Um, so I, I encourage everybody to, to, to visit these sites and to, uh, um, you know, particularly if you're doing, uh, doing research on these. And then um, the uh, OKHistoryCenter.org, all, th all three of these places are, are functioning out of the same area of it. They're, you know they're all there to uh, to help us better understand and find the information that that we want. People usually have a very specific reason for researching, and not everyone is after the same thing. So uh, all three of these places will will help in in telling a better story about about the Civil War here. So. These are some of the other related sites that are in states around us. And uh, and areas around us that um, that that we can travel and visit and get uh, a very good uh, uh, picture of, of the uh, of the vastness of the war here. You know, everybody has this thought process that those borders along Kansas and Missouri and Arkansas and Texas, and we were just in this vacuum right here, and that no one knew what was going on when the war started, and it couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, that, um, that, that, that the government of the Cherokee Nation and of the other nations that were in Indian Territory knew full well what was headed towards them. I mean, they understood the consequences of by, you know, by, you know, choosing sides or, you know, not choosing sides, um, that they understood the politics of what was happening in the United States at the time. So, you know, it, it, was, they, they, you know, it was not a, a vacuum by any, you know, by any means. So, um, 
So if you travel up to uh, Fort Scott, Kansas, which is in, very, in the very southeastern corner of Kansas, um, funny thing is, is that, um, that Fort Scott lies about 10 miles north of, uh, um, of, of the old boundary of the Cherokee Nation. So um, there's a, a lot of great discussion and talk and topic about, about the neutral lands, which was the very southeastern corner of Kansas. And that whenever refugees had left here and went to Kansas, okay, when they went into those neutral lands up there, what Kansas was starting to consider, you know, this was ours as soon as the war broke out. And they, whenever the Federal Army came back to Indian Territory, um, they, uh, they said, you guys need to, to go back home. And they said, no, we're Cherokees, we're staying here, this is our home. And they said, no, you need to go back to, you know, to, to, to the Cherokee Nation. And they said, no, you don't understand, this is a neutral lands, this is our nation. So there was, there, you know, there, there are, you know, several um, documents and information and things that you can, you can see when you go to Fort Scott in their library and their archives up there where there were, there were Cherokee citizens arguing the fact that the, 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 that the neutral lands were still theirs, that they hadn't forfeited anything. So, um, but this is the place that where the, uh, um, all of the, the Indian Home Guard regiments were, were uh, formed up. They were equipped at, at Fort Scott, and, uh, and it is interpreted there. So um, you, can, uh, you can travel up there and see that. Of course, Fort Blair, which was the, uh, is, is at Baxter Springs, um, that was uh, was was one of the first stops um, where you would uh, where would you would stop on the on the military road coming from Fort Scott back to uh, back into Fort Gibson, and uh, they have a new museum, interpretive center, and everything at this place. Um, so it's a <clears throat> it's a it's worth a stop to um, you know to uh, to understand you know a little bit more of the uh, of the the vastness of. Of, of the of the war, um, of course, uh, <clears throat> Pea Ridge National Battlefield, um, heavy interpretation on there. Stan Wadey's men fought at um, fought at this battle. They were uh, um, they fought on the on the on the side, of course, of the Confederacy. Um, this was uh, and, and also this you know was probably one of the um, you know of course it was one of the first battles of the war, but uh, the 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 outcome of this battle um, probably had a um, kind of an outreaching effect back in the Cherokee Nation. Um, it also had a, a, a kind of a, a, of a demoralizing effect on, uh, on some of the leaders that were in Indian Territory because the troops that fought there were never intended to be, the, 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 the Indian troops that fought in this battle were never intended to be taken out of Indian Territory um, to fight there. So. Um, so the, uh, the, the the Cherokees and some of the other uh, um, and, and some of the other uh, Choctaws that were at this at this battle um, were not very happy about about being taken across the border um, to to fight in a in a conflict in Arkansas. So, but um, but there's a large part of their interpretation at this uh, at this uh, site that deals with. Um, with the Cherokee regiments that fought there, it's it's well marked out. You can walk out on the battlefield and stand right there where Wadey's men captured the, um, you know, the Confederate batteries and and uh, later were driven from the field. But um, and of course Wilson's Creek uh, battlefield, which is over by Springfield, Missouri, um, this is uh, um, was uh, was the first documented uh, battle that that. Um, that are the first time that, that, that they can document that Cherokee, uh, that, that Cherokees were killed in the, in, uh, in the Civil War. So um, is it at, uh, at Wilson's Creek Battlefield. And um, this is probably one of, the, one of the few battlefields and places that you will go that, um, that looks very much exactly about the same as it did whenever the, um, whenever the war happened. So it's, a, um, it's, a, it's kind of a neat place to visit. Um, the Cane Hill, Arkansas. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this place, but it has a, it has it has a, a whole lot more Cherokee history there than just um, than just the Civil War as well. Um, this uh, there were there were two there was a major battle in two in in, a, in two minor engagements at at Cane Hill, um, but before the war, um, this is one of the at, at, there was a college at Cane Hill. 
uh, for ladies. And this, and before the establishment of the female seminary, uh, this is where um, many of the Cherokee girls went to school before um, before the, the the seminary was built. Before before, uh, before the female seminary was established. So um, so there was a, a a connection there long before the war. Um, but if you go, if you go to Cane Hill today, excuse me, that um, that there there are interpretive panels throughout the town that mark out the the uh, the fight that um, that happened there, the, the major engagement where um, where General Blunt fought uh, General Marmaduke from uh, um, from Arkansas, and then um, and then during the Battle of uh, of Prairie Grove. Uh, General Blunt was encamped at Cane Hill with um, with the Third Indian Home Guard and several of the other Kansas regiments, and um, and the, the Confederates attacked um, this uh, this detachment at Cane Hill to give them the impression that um, that they were the, the the main assault of the day, uh, when in reality um, uh, General Thomas Hindman, um, who actually has a connection to us. Here in Park Hill, um, he was the first cousin of uh, of, uh, of George Merle's wives. So his uh, um, their mother and his mother were uh, um, were uh, were sisters, and um, he uh, took the main part of the Confederate Army to uh, to the little village of Prairie Grove, uh, where they were attacked by uh, um, a, by General Heron. And uh, this was probably one of the one of the larger engagements that happened in Northwest Arkansas um, after the Battle of Pea Ridge. Um, the Confederacy was kind of kind of foundered. It uh, they regrouped, they uh, they conscripted a lot of men from Arkansas. A lot of them who really didn't want to have anything to do with the war. Many of them were from Northwest Arkansas. Um, if you start studying Northwest Arkansas. And, uh, and you start studying Cherokee Nation at this time, you'll find out that the two mindsets were pretty close to the same, is that we really don't care about your war, you know, as long as it doesn't involve us. So stay away from us and fight it out all you want to, but, you know, keep it in your backyard and don't bring it to ours. So they, um, um, so a lot of those men from Northwest Arkansas were not happy about being pulled into the Confederate Army and uh, they really weren't very happy about being pulled into the federal army later on. But they, um, you know, they they still, uh, um, you know, were were forced to fight for the Confederacy for a brief moment. And um, and after the war, after the battle was over, um, they, uh, uh, of course, the the Confederates lost, and that pretty much cleared the way for you know for the rest of. Of, uh, of the Federal Army to come in and, and take charge of uh, Northwest Arkansas. So it takes a, it takes a few years for, uh, for the Federals to, to, to break the back of the Confederacy in, uh, in the Cherokee Nation in Northwest Arkansas. But by the time that uh, the battle at uh, Prairie Grove is over, um, they, uh, um, they, they pretty much know that they can, they can take control of this area. It, um, and then, of course, uh, uh, Fort Smith National Historic Site that's down on the border. Um, it, uh, Fort Smith was, what year was Fort Smith established, Catherine? She's not listening to me. Fort Smith, date, when was it started? 1817? Christmas Day, 1817. And um, it, it was, uh, so it's, Fort Smith has been there for a very long time. It, um, um, and of course, continued long after the war. But uh, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of history that can be obtained at at, at Fort Smith and down there as well. So, um, and I think that's kind of about all right. So question time. So, how about sites on the Confederate side? Um, sites on the Confederate side. Well, like what? Other than Dokesville, you're looking at about it. I mean, I, I, that's about the only thing that that I know of that you can physically walk to. And and uh, now there is one place in Texas that you can go and learn a little bit. I, I was kind of very surprised that you know when I went there for a visit, Sam Bell Maxey's home in um, in uh, Paris, Texas. 
um, is uh, you know is it, kind of a kind of a neat place, and, and they don't have a lot up there as far as you know you can walk in and read it. But their their tour guide <coughs> knew about his participation in the war in Indian Territory, and I mean she was just throwing it out there. So it's a it's a pretty pretty good place to you know to. Do. I got a question about uh, the local <coughs> battle that happened. We call it the Battle of Barron Right. Now, nothing's marked over there. Right. And all these folks here, they know where Welling Bridge is. Yeah. And what I've been told is just kind of east of that, across those fields and up on that hill. Right. Is that true? Is that where that happened? I, I, I don't know. I've never, I've never been out there and. And all that. That's what I've heard. That that's about the general location of it. So, and there's like a brief mention in the in the ORs, you know, like those 95,000 books. You know, they had official records, and two of them have anything to do with us here. And um, and there's a there's a brief mention of it in there. So no, I don't know. I wish I could answer that one for you. Hard to find anything on that. So yeah, it is. Battle, I, I believe it happened. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a mention of it. Uh, I mean, there's the, the in the in the and and I can't remember the gentleman right off the top of my head that that wrote it. But there's a correspondence in there about a about a skirmish at, on the Baron Fort. Mm -hmm. So and I and I'm assuming that that's probably, you know, what they all talk about. Yes, ma'am. Was the Battle of Round Mountain? I don't know. <laughs> that's what I've heard. Okay. I that, um, anyone know where that was? Um, oh, I think that, that, that there are several people that speculate. Some think it's, it's, some think it's near um, Sand Springs, and some think it's near um, Stillwater, and some think it's further down in the Creek Nation. And, and um, okay. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's a lot of speculation, but I don't think there's been anybody that's really. You know, I mean, there's been a few people that have found some evidence for, you know, for for several places that they think that it could have been, um, but I don't think there's been anything, you know, definitively that's been laid out there about it. Is there anything marked at Perryville? So, no, there's nothing marked at Perryville either. So, what are you doing back there? <laughs> so. Um, I think that well, actually, the Honey Springs just uh, just acquired their um, national landmark status. So you know, like the Merle Home and Fort Gibson and all those other places, they have national significance, um, and they just got their their uh, their certificate. But I don't know who's know who knows. They've been talking about it since 1965. So yeah, it's a. I heard they were out there recently. Yeah. National Park Service to take it over. Yeah, they, 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 they could be, but I don't know. Yes, ma'am. If someone wanted to volunteer at Fort Gibson or the Merle Home or maybe at the, um, one of the battle sites at one of your events, how would they go about doing so? Um, call the site. Um, you can contact uh, Corey Twilley at Fort Gibson, and, uh, or you can, uh, you can contact uh, Amanda Pritchett at, at the Merle Home. And yeah, we're always taking volunteers. We can't do what we do if you guys don't volunteer and help us out. So, it uh, some of our some of our programs that we have take take. I mean, we have about two staff members at each one of these sites, and um, and so uh, it uh, we run off of volunteers. So, so they could join friends of the Merle. Home. Well, they could join friends of the Merle Home. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for helping me with that. I'm sorry, guys. I've, I've spent about the last two weeks in the in the hospital with my grandmother, and so I'm I'm a little lackadaisical at the present second. So you got to hit me with something, you know, throw something at me. Um, so, but yes, we do. We have uh, we have support groups at both of those places, and if you uh, if you uh, if you contact those sites, um, and later on, if you if you want the, the the numbers or the contact information for me after we're over with, I'll be happy to give you those. So. We do. We have open house coming up. My favorite event. It it, uh, it happens the what is it second weekend? Sunday, Sunday, December the eighth. Thank you. 
It, uh, I tell you what, I'm going to take her around with me everywhere. She knows dates. So yeah, December the 8th, and it's uh, open house is always great. We have uh, we have food. The house is open. People can wander through. The the Merle home is 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 one of my favorite places because I mean we have such great stuff there. You know, it's a um, we have probably the largest collection of of antebellum you know furnishings that are you know you know from this family. So you know it's just not you know antiques that we've we brought in to dress out the house. This is this you know these are their you know this is their material culture, and um, so you know it's always a yeah, one to four. One to four, one to four. And the food's always great, too. Did I say that we're having food? And, uh, yeah, that's my favorite part of the day. So it's a... Uh, but you got to have a question, Tommy. You're sitting there looking at me, man. <laughs> How much food? <laughs> well, let me put it to you this way, okay? Is that, that, that we... I have never seen us run out of food. It... Uh, it we, we uh, now we, we we came close one year because we were on the tour of homes and and we had probably what five hundred and some odd people in a in about two hours and and uh, you know that old story about fishes and loaves you know and, uh, so we pardon are any of your sites haunted I still didn't hear are any of your sites haunted are any of our sites haunted um, I don't know you know people ask me that all the time. I, I've I've been there for what about five years now. Now I've never seen anything that I mean I live right on the ground. Surely lived there for about almost fifteen and and uh, but but I tell you what um, I, I've never seen anything that kind of made me say yeah I really kind of believe in that. But uh, but but man you can sure scare yourself sometimes in those places. <laughs> so it uh, I don't really don't like I don't I don't like going over in the house by myself. It uh, yes ma'am. Uh, the Murrow uh, house is, uh, is, is remarkable. It's, it's, it's beautiful and, and, and all of those wonderful things. Was there, were there other comparable kinds of residences that were lost? Yes, ma'am. It, uh, um, the, the Murrow home is the, is the only surviving um, plantation mansion that we have left in the state. Um, the uh, the Van family um, down at Weber's Falls had a um, you know the Van home in in uh, was it Georgia? Georgia? Thank you, Georgia. Yes, and um, it, it um, that whenever you know Mr. Van came to Indian Territory built a built a house they say duplicate of that. Um, it was burned during the war. Um, you know, of course the the you know the Waiters and the Ridge families all had you know very prosperous. You know, homes as well. You know, the Martin family um, that that was at at Pensacola. Um, you know, Greenbrier Joe Martin had a. Um, some say that it was a it was a frame house. Others say it was a three story brick home. Um, Lewis Ross at Salina had a um, had a his his house later became the Cherokee National Orphanage. Um, so, and there are pictures, I don't know if you got one over in the case over there, but there are, you know, photographs of, of his home, and it was massive. I mean, it was, you know, a, a you know, three-story brick home, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, you know Mr. Merle, um, and then Chief Ross's home was, you know, probably larger than the Merle home was. So I don't know. How, how big was, how big, are you guys kind of laid the footprint out of? I think it would have been a little bit larger than Merle yeah. home, but still a Greek revival. Yeah. Right. So, and, and there's a and there's a watercolor of, of uh, of Rose Cottage too that you know you so you can you can see what Chief Ross's home looked like, <clears throat> and then, you know there were some, you know you know very well to do folks that um, that had you know you know, you know log homes that you know that that were very nice as well. So you know that you know yes there were and then, not only in Cherokee Nation but you know also uh, you know the McIntosh family and the Creek Nation. Um, you know, there were, uh, uh, you know, the Jones family and the Choctaw Nation and the Colberts, they all had, you know, you know, built Greek Revival style homes, um, things of that nature. So, yeah, there were, there were, you know, quite a few very large, you know, you know, mansions of that nature built, you know, throughout the, you know, the Indian Territory. So not just in Cherokee Nation, so. But, you know, they, uh, um, you know, it, it uh, 
Um, there's a, a, a very funny kind of thing when you look at it. You know, a lot of folks don't realize that, you know, the, the, the whole economy base in, in Indian Territory before the war, but, you know, if you could get it on a steamboat and get it to, you know, to one of the ports, um, that, uh, you know, you, you could have, you know, anything here. Uh, I mean, and, you know, our archaeology in the, um, you know, at these historic sites, you know, you know, prove the, you know, the, the vastness of, of, you know, the, of the, you know, the material things that were being brought into the, you know, in, into Indian Territory at that time. So, um, you know, the, you know, the Merles and the Rosses, they sent people on shopping sprees, you know, to bring goods back to their, you know, to their, their mercantile stores. So, you know, the old, uh, you know, the old days of the United States and their government trading houses, you know, where they're trading stuff is like this long gone by this time. They're, you know, you know, Cherokees are doing it for themselves. You know, they're like, well, you know, we're not going to let you shove it down our throat. Well, we'll just go buy the stuff ourselves and start our own stores. How about that? So, you know, it, uh, you know, there's a, there's a store on every corner, it seems like, in, uh, in Cherokee Nation in, in about the 1840s and 50s. So there's what, six in Park Hill, something like that, five or six? I mean, it seems like on the old maps that you look at, I think the John Ross had one, the Megs had one, Merle had one. Uh, I mean, they were just, you know, kind of makes you wonder who was going to what. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, and then of course at Fort Gibson, there were two or three, and there was one halfway between here with the, uh, the Fields family, between here and, and, uh, and Fort Gibson. So. So if, if you had enough money and you want to start a mercantile store, you know, it, it's a good business to be in. Tree Grove so. has that ladder house. It's kind of cool that they say we've moved over from around the outside skill. Or what's that called? Evansville. Evansville. Yeah. Yeah. And then the ladders were brought over by Mural yeah. to help work his land. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, James Ladda was uh, was James, all right? I got his name. I get him and John mixed up. James Ladda yeah, was the overseer for for uh, for Mr. Merle and, and his wife uh, taught at the uh, at the mission. So they. Uh, yeah. Well, I just found out about a week ago that they rented rooms out, and my uncle lived in the upstairs south side. In the in the in the Merle home, yep. Yeah, that house has been used for many many things. I mean, you know, when you when you when you look at its history, I mean, you know, it, it, we drive by it today and just think, wow, it's kind of a kind of a neat old house. But um, you know, it it really kind of is a you know, I mean, it, not to sound kind of weird and corny, but it really is kind of a living breathing sort of thing, you know, because it, it's it's a safe haven. I mean, there's a you know, after the you know during the war, it becomes a you know a a, a haven for uh, uh, E. Jane Ross and her mother, who is Chief John Ross's sister, and um, you know they ride the war out in this home. After the war is over with, there are there are members of the Ross family who have been you know devastated, their homes burnt, everything's gone, that live in the house. You know, so it it it, it seems that the Merle home is always a, a a fallback for people you know who who need it. And, um, you know, I mean that, that you know, that, that uh, you, know, for, you know, for the Ross family, for later on in the years, it's rented out. You know, there's always some reason that, you know, that, I mean, that, that people need to be at the Merle home, you know. So it's, uh, it's really a, a very fascinating and neat place for us to, um, you know, to be able to, to have. And it's the last one we got, you know. Why did Wadey spare that one? Um, you know, lots of theories on that. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, some think it's, it's, uh, um, some think that it's, it's, uh, um, you know, the, uh, political alliance, you know, that one, you know, that Mr. Merle was, you know, for the, the Confederacy and others think that, you know, that, um, you know, that it's because of, of, you know, that, you know, Chief Ross's, uh, um, you know, or eventually the Rosses side with the, uh, with the with the federal government, but um, you know, probably luck. <laughs> I mean, and that and that is the you know there. I mean, there is a strong affiliation on both sides. It was raided many times, but um, you know, but I I think, 
you know, without being able to dig into the psyche and, you know, know exactly, you know, without finding a letter that says, this is the reason why I didn't burn his house down, um, is that right about the time that, um, that all this happens, um, Stan Wadey's wife writes a letter to him, and they talk about, um, and, and someone had told her that, that her boys had been involved in a in a, a senseless shooting of uh, of you know of, of defenseless unarmed men, and uh, whether they did it or not, they were there and present and saw it, and um, and also she had you know she had persuaded them, you know to to have a little bit of leniency, and uh, you know if they wanted you know quarter in the next life, they better give it in this one, and so that could have had an effect on him as to why he didn't do it, but. You know, they did try to light it, but they were able to, they were able to put the, you know, they burnt some of the curtains and some of the fabrics, but, um, but they were able to put it out, so. I, I don't know, man, I wish I'd give you, Shirley might be able to help you better with that question, but it's, it's. I came up with a theory, and I yeah. don't know if this is true, that Stan Wadey was a Mason and so was George Mill. Yep. But so was John Ross, and that didn't keep him from burning his house down. Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's a. You know, there's there's four or five avenues that a guy could maybe maybe you know that's a good project for one of our our younger historians coming up that they really need to dig deep and find out why, you know. But uh, you know, I always just think it's just because we're lucky, you know, and uh, and we get to we we still get to you know to have that that piece of of our history left. So, and and people are fascinated by the by the house. I mean they. They, you know, they come, you know, from all over the United States and the world, and, and they, you know, they walk in and just marvel at the fact that, you know, that this home is still there, so. <coughs> is that it? <laughs> What's your next big event? Our next big event, um, our next big event at the Merle Home is, uh, is December the 8th. And uh, and and at Fort Gibson, our next big event is that we're hoping that they're going to start uh, restoration on our log fort. So we're getting ready to do a million and a half dollars worth of uh, of restoration to the uh, to the to the log stockade down at the bottom of the hill, which was was uh, rebuilt by the WPA. So it's a it's a WPA project, and um, Oklahoma has a lot of really great. WPA project, several in the town of Fort Gibson, and, and the reconstructing the log fort was one of them. And it's had about 50 years of deferred maintenance, and so now we, we, have, a, we have a grant for a million and a half dollars to, uh, to do some renovation to that. So we were supposed to start in October, it got pushed back to November, now it's pushed back to 1st of December. But it is going to happen. So. It's a visitor yeah. The visitor center is still open, but the the log stockade we don't have access to it. I've been reluctant to say it's closed because every time I say it's closed, everybody, you know, thinks that the whole entire fort's closed. But our visitor center, um, which is located at uh, 907 Garrison in one of the stone buildings up on the ridge up there, um, it uh, it's still open. We we still have our our uh, historic structures that that are at the at the top of Garrison Hill. Are uh, are open, and we have a um, a new uh, a display on the inside of the visitor center that's about Fort Gibson and and uh, um, and the war in Indian Territory. So we started in 1863, and um, and from 1863 to the end of the war. So um, so you can go in there and see the uniforms that the home guards were wearing representative clothing of, of the Confederate troops that were continually attacking the, the, the fort and harassing the area around the, around the, the garrison there. And so. Right. The, 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 the structures at the top of the hill, I wish I had a better picture. I don't know if it shows them or not on that, does it? That um, <clears throat> there are, if you can kind of look past that, little dog trot building right there. You can see some stone buildings that are kind of way back in the tree line back up there at the top of the hill. The fort started out in, in, at the, at the, on the river, which was the main avenue of travel at that time. So it started out on the Grand River, and, uh, and later in, in, in 1844, 
they were given permission to move the fort from the floodplain up to to the <clears throat> to the uh, to the hill above, about 100, 200 yards um, up the hill, which is where they should have built it in the first place. And um, so they started construction on those. In 1846, when the United States went to war with Mexico, they, they took the entire garrison from Fort Gibson, brought some troops from Arkansas over to, to man the fort, and the rest of those guys went off and fought in Mexico. Um, they, they had about um, three buildings started, and uh, they stopped uh, work on those buildings throughout the, the time of, of, the, of the Mexican War with Mexico. Um, so and then in 1848, when the Army came back and they released the, the Arkansas troops, um, they started construction on those buildings again. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the very large stone barracks building, the, the commissary, and the powder magazine were, were all three there at the time that, um, that the Federal Army came back in. <clears throat> the, um, the, the Confederates held the fort for a while, but weren't really interested that much in trying to, you know, stop a large army from, from coming in there. So they just marched out of the fort, went across over into the Creek Nation and thought, you know, things will be fine. Well, then the Federal Army came in and dug in like a tick up on the top of that hill. And they built fortifications that went all the way from down to the river, circling all the way around the ridge and, um, and, and, and encircled those buildings. And they were using those buildings as supply you know, for, their, you know, to, for their armies and for the refugees that lived around there. So about 13,000 refugees um, settled around um, Fort Gibson um, during the war. So originally when they, when they first brought them back, they brought them back to Park Hill. So from Cabin Creek, when, they, when the Federal Army re -in, you know, invaded back into Indian Territory, um, all of the, the, the refugees that were with the 3rd Indian Home Guards, um, they brought them from Cabin Creek to Park Hill. And then, of course, at Park Hill, they were wide open targets all the time. So they all started filtering from here over to... Uh, um, over to, uh, um, to Fort Gibson and around in that area. So by the time that the war was over with, everybody was like, you know, around that, uh, you know, around that garrison out there living in the, in the valleys and everything between there. So there's a really, um, there's a really great uh, um, uh, account of the war um, by a gentleman named Robert Peck, who was a, a teamster um, with the Federal Army. And he witnessed the battles at Cabin Creek. He, he, uh, um, he drove a, a, a wagon. Actually, he was a wagon boss. So he was in charge of five or six guys in a, in a, in, you know, in the, in a, you know, over an overall huge wagon train. So they broke it up kind of like the Army does, where you have one man in charge of four or five. And um, so very vivid, you know, memory of the war in about 1902 or something like that. They published his, his memoirs in a newspaper out of Kansas talking about the war here in Indian Territory. And oddly enough, you know, a lot of times you think, well, this guy's writing about this, you know, 20 years after the fact. You know, he was 20 then. He's, you know, 80 now. You know, what can he really remember all that well? But what we find is, as, it, as you read through his, his journals, he's really actually very accurate about what he's talking about. And, um, you know, and, and one of the greatest parts that I always remember when I'm reading through there is that he, you know, they, they're coming, they're bringing refugees into, uh, into Park Hill, and he rides up to the, to the female seminary. And he talks about how, you know, there's not towns until they get to, you know, to... Uh, um, you know, to Tahlequah. And he said, Tahlequah is the first place that we come to that's actually laid out like a town. Not realizing how, you know, most, you know, communities are within the Cherokee Nation where everybody's living in a community, you know, instead of, you know, everything has to be laid out on a little square town with everybody living around there, you know. I mean, and we live like that today, you know, that, you know, you go out to this place out here and everybody's related and all the way around, you know, and then, and there may be a store connected to it, you know, but, you know, you definitely got your church and all the other things that you need, and it's a community. And, uh, but he talks about that, you know, and so it's kind of neat to get to see his, you know, an outsider's vision of the way that they kind of see things. But, um, but they ride from town out to the, to the female seminary, so what they, you know, 
these Teamsters do is they don't set on a ride on a wagon. Okay, they drive from the first horse on the ground. So they always, they, they, you know, they can unhook those mules and then they ride that mule wherever they want to go to see what's out and about out there. So they're out on a little joy ride on their mules to see what's happening. And as they get to the seminary, he talks about it, you know, mentions it. And they look out, he says, over a massive cornfield. So today if we go to that ridge and look out across there, we don't look out over a massive cornfield, we look out over a massive nursery. And so all of that area between where the female seminary is and where the Merle home is today was the agricultural land for, um, you know, that those, all of those Ross family members down through there were sharing that. Okay, so that was where they had their cornfields and, and, and where they were raising most of their, of their food. So, um, you know, so he gives you a, a really good kind of insight uh, on that. And then, of course, there's a, another letter from John Drew to George Merle as Merle's looking for, you know, his family, wanting to know where they're at. And, um, and John Drew says, well, I wouldn't come back here because you have the entire, you know, federal army encamped on your property. And, um, and of course, that's paraphrasing it. But, but, I mean, it's along that line of saying that, you know, that, yes, there are people, you, know, you know, the federal army has brought refugees and they're all camped here. And it just coincides with what you know, so you have a you know historical document. And you have a 20 year after the fact, and both of those match up together really well. So, so we're very fortunate that um, you know that that there is a lot of written you know documentation, a lot of letters by the you know by the Ross family members that are written back and forth, and they're you know they're just you know they're scattered everywhere, and uh, you know one of these days hopefully we'll get somebody to pull them all together, but. You know, pieces of, of uh, you know, we, you know, as historians, we piece these together every day, and that's what these gentlemen are doing on the, you know, on their project. You know, we're doing it at the Merle Home. You know, it's a, uh, um, you know, we're doing it at Fort Gibson Historic Site. You know, that's why the, you know, the history, you know, the, 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 right, you know, the written documents that are out there, um, all of that good stuff are all pieces of puzzles that we put together every day to, to, to try to tell a better you know, a better picture of our, of our history. So it, um, and it's fun. We've got the greatest job in the world, man. I mean, it's, a, it's very stressful sometimes, and we wish that we made more than $2 an hour, but we do it because we love it. So isn't that right? <laughs> so... All right. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys, for having me. All right. And um, for those of you who might be interested in watching some of this later or, um, you know, I saw some people taking notes, but this is archived online at Cherokee.org. I know David hates hearing that. <laughs> but it is available for viewing and will be archived on Cherokee.org. So you can go online and, and check that out. And as I mentioned, we are uh, planning on starting these up again in January. So we'll be doing monthly history presentations um, starting then. So thank you all for coming out. And thank you again, David, for giving a great Thanks presentation. Thank you, guys. Here.